Intellectual and Manual Labor, A Critique of Epistemology by Alfred Son Rothel, or Rothel, Rothel. <laughs> Chapter 9, The Independent Intellect. A. Self-alienation and self-direction. We have not yet pursued to its conclusion the process of identification, which we have chosen as the most exacting means for illustrating the theoretical issue contained in the conversion of the real abstraction of exchange into the ideal abstraction of conceptual thought. This results in the independent intellect. Only at the final conclusion of the identification are the resulting concepts cut off from their origin. Only at this point can it be said that, as abstract thought is engendered, it is cut off from its root, by its root and at its root. This is because the real abstraction of exchange has as its distinguishing mark the total exclusion of empirical content. Its abstractness is non-empirical. Thus, if it or any of its elements are correctly identified, this results in the formation of concepts as non-empirical as the exchange abstraction itself. And being non-empirical, they bear no trace of the locality, the date, or any other circumstances of their origin. They stand outside the realm of sense perception without, however, forfeiting their own prime claim to reality. But this reality is that of being as a whole, not that of any specific object. It must further be understood that because it is cut off from its social origin, the abstract intellect emerges with a peculiar normative sense all its own, serving as its logic. We have observed this phenomenon when discussing the Parmenidian concept, a Greek word that I can't read, especially in the light of Hegel's interpretation. Here, the non-empirical conceptual abstraction, when it emerges clearly, proves to be connected from the very beginning with its own sense of truth and untruth, and a kind of reasoning characterized by argument of logic. These are the properties which the Greeks understood as the powers of dialectic. Thus, the conversion involves both self-alienation and self-direction. The explanation of this normative sense, which carries the logical independence of the abstract intellect and is responsible for its cognitive faculty, lies in the very nature of the exchange abstraction. The entire exchange abstraction is founded upon social postulate and not upon fact. It is a postulate that the use of commodities must remain suspended until the exchange has taken place. It is a postulate that no physical change should occur in the in the commodities, and this still applies even if the facts belly it. It is a postulate that the commodities in the exchange relation should count as equal despite their factual difference. It is a postulate that the alienation and acquisition of things between commodity owners is tied to the condition of exchangeability. It is a postulate that commodities change owners by translation from one locality to another without being materially affected. None of these form concepts imply statements of fact. They are all norms which commodity exchange has to obey to be possible and to enable anarchical society to survive by the rules of reification. B. The relational shift. This statement does not in itself provide the full explanation required, for these postulates apply directly only to social relations and to people's manner of action, and are a far cry from the normative character of the abstract intellect in its understanding of nature. The truth is that the process of conversion yielding this intellect undergoes a most remarkable shift, even while following the straightforward line of identification. The real abstraction arises in exchange from the reciprocal relationship between two commodity owners, and it applies only to this interrelationship. Nothing that a single commodity owner might undertake on his own could give rise to this abstraction. No more than a hammock could play its part when attached to one pole only. It is purely owing to the interlocking of the exchanging agents and the reciprocity of their claims. Their do, do at des, I give that you may give. That the act of exchange assumes its abstract nature and that this abstraction endows exchange with its socially synthetic function. 
to apply the exchange relation to Robinson Crusoe in his dealings with the nature surrounding him, as bourgeois economists are so fond of doing, removes all trace of the real abstraction from what they call exchange. Yet, strangely enough, when the real abstraction has finally been converted into the conceptual structure of the abstract intellect, we are faced with a relationship not so far removed from that of Robinson to nature. For this intellect applies itself to external reality in accordance with the familiar subject, object pattern, of the relationship of cognition. The relational, the relational shift is so complete that it seems to make an absurdity of our contention that such a contrast is the result of nothing more devious than a process of successful identification. And yet, on closer scrutiny, it can be seen that this complete change of scenery if I may thus describe the relationship or the relational shift, is an integral and inevitable part of the very process of the conversion. We clearly saw that the real abstraction inherent in exchange becomes discernible only in coined money. In any previous commercial practice still compatible with communal forms of society, in fact interper interspersed throughout the near and eastern Mediterranean orbit with remnants of such forms, the real abstraction was, of course, equally operative, but in a way absolutely concealed from the human mind. The introduction and spread of coinage, however, ousted communal production and heralded a form of social synthesis rooted in reification, so-called because the social context of people is transformed into the social context of their products, intercommunicating in the monetary terms of their prices, their commodity language, as Marx puts it. We shall return to these historical aspects of our subject in part two of this book. Coined money operates as the functional intermediary of the social synthesis. The commodity owners no longer refer to each other, but to their money. Thus, only at the advanced stage of reification prevailing in commodity production at its full growth to the conditions arise where the conversion of the real abstraction into conceptual terms becomes a possibility. And under these conditions, the elements of the exchange abstraction present themselves to the human mind, one single mind every time, as properties of objects, which in fact relate to nature, not to money. C. Conversion post festum of exchange. Marks after the event. In the first place, it must be reiterated that the conversion of the exchange abstraction does not take place as a part of commercial activities. For its commercial purposes, coinage is perfectly adequate in its empirical state, as made of metal or its substitutes. The discrepancy between the actual coinage and the exchange abstraction cannot leave its mark on people in the bustle and fray of the market, but strikes them only as a matter for contemplation and mental reflection. Here we enter into the cognitive relationship of subject to object, and the object within this relationship stands for nature. For, in the second place, we must be clear as to the precise con contents of the exchange abstraction. These contents are nothing but the basic features of the physical act of commodity transfer between private own owners. It is this physical event which is abstract. This is precisely why we have called it the real abstraction. It is a compound of the most fundamental elements of nature, such as space, time, matter, movement, quantity, and so on. The concepts which results from the identification of these elements are thus in their origin concepts of nature. Between them, they constitute an all-encompassing pattern or framework of nature in the abstract. In logical terms, they can be described as non-empirical, purely formal concepts of timeless universality. And they can relate to nothing other than to a nature seen as physical object world antithetically divided from the social world of man and from its history. The world of the concepts based on the exchange abstraction is the same as that criticized by Marx in a famous footnote of Capital Volume 1, where he speaks of the abstract materialism of natural science, a materialism that excludes the historical process. D. Division of Society and Nature what happens at the formation of this non-human object world of nature is a peculiar turnabout of the emerging intellect at the concluding point of the conversion. 
while the non-empirical concepts which make up the intellect's impersonal equipment wipe out every trace of its social origin and cause it to stand, as it were, with its back to society, these same concepts turn into instruments of cognition facing the external reality of nature. For by their abstractness from all sense reality of use, the concepts also lose all human reference and retain non-human nature as their only content. Conceptual reasoning emerges in a process which causes an impenetrable self-alienation of the abstract intellect and at the same time endows it with a capacity of logical self-direction. Once the elements of the real abstraction have assumed conceptual form, their character, rooted in social postulate, evolves into the dialectic of logical argument attached to the concepts. The, arguments, the argument concerns the application and the interpretation of the concepts as either right or wrong, correct or incorrect. Thus, the Parmenidian, a Greek term, referring, according to our contention, to the material that coinage should be made of, but is not and cannot be made of, become prescriptive of the correct way to reason about reality. And this correct way as a general rule will conform to the makeup of the existing social formation based on commodity production. The reasoning itself, however, is totally impervious to this conformity since its alienation blinds it to society. This creates the division of society and nature which emerges with commodity production and outdates the anthropomorphic blending characteristic of the communal forms of society preceding commodity production. Francis Cornford gives a telling example of such an anthropomorphism when he quotes Sophocles from Oedipus Rex. So when a sin has been committed, such as the unconscious incest of Oedipus, all nature is poisoned by the offense of man. The land of Thebes wasteth in the fruitless buds of earth in parched herds and travai without birth of dying women. As George Thompson puts it, in primitive thought, society and nature had been one. Thales and Anaximander succeeded in separating nature from society and presenting it as an external reality existing independently of man. Similarly, Solon succeeded in separating society from nature and presenting it as a moral order based on obligations peculiar to man. In other words, just as Anaximander objectified nature, so Solon objectified society. E. Reification at the root of the intellect. It may be confusing to be told that the notion of nature as a physical object world, independent of man, emerges from commodity production when it reaches its full growth of monetary economy. Nevertheless, this is a true description of the way in which this conception of nature is rooted in history. It arises when social relations assume the impersonal and reified character of commodity exchange. We saw that in exchange, the action is social, whereas the minds are private, and that it is the physical action of the commodity transfer between the owners, which is abstract. The action of exchange stands in antithetic polarity to the sense reality of things in the private minds of the individuals in their social life. The non-empirical concepts drawn from the real abstraction describe that action reduced to barebone physical reality. It is a reality carrying universal social validity among all exchanging agents. These concepts have a objective reality and application to natural events because they relate to form categories of physical events of a kind which could be described as the absolute minimum of what can constitute a natural event for they are events which happen while the material status of things undergoes no change. They constitute the paradigm of mechanistic thinking. Its concepts are, in their origins, the forms of the act of commodity exchange, and in their content, the basic categories of nature as object world in antithetic contrast to man's own social world. The content of these concepts bears absolutely no reference to money. Their only trait relating to money and to exchange is their abstractness. The abstractness itself is the work and outcome of exchange. But this fact is completely unrecognizable to any mind or intellect using these concepts. Such an intellect is bound to be alienated by false consciousness when it tries to explain its own mode of thinking. 
The self-explanation assumes the materialistic or the idealistic variant according to whether its basic concepts are recognized as non-empirical or as derived from external reality. Non-empirical concepts cannot be explained in materialistic ways, that is by way of direct reflection, and idealism is thus at an epistemological premium regardless of its blatant absurdities otherwise. F. Knowledge from sources other than manual labor. Owing to the concepts drawn from the exchange abstraction, the intellect is equipped with instruments of cognition which, if employed in a suitable method, can yield a knowledge of nature from sources totally alien to manual labor. It is a knowledge ruled by a logic of appropriation, or more precisely, by a logic of the reciprocal appropriation which rules in the market, as opposed to manual production. A logic of production could only be the logic of producers for the pursuit of their production, individually or in common. It would be a logic of unity of head and hand, whereas the logic of the market and of mechanistic thinking is a logic of intellectual labor divided from manual labor. Therefore, the concepts deriving from the exchange abstraction, that is the concepts of mechanistic thinking, we may term as original categories of intellectual labor. It is a labor serviceable to the rule of private property and in particular to capital. It is the science of intellectual labor springing from the second nature which is founded upon non-empirical abstraction and on concepts of an a priori nature. The form elements of the exchange abstraction are of such fundamental caliber, abstract time and space, abstract matter, quantity as a mathematical abstraction, abstract motion, etc., that there cannot be a natural event in the world which could elude these basic features of nature. They make up between them a kind of abstract framework into which all observable phenomena are bound to fit. Anything descriptive of this framework, such as, for example, the geometry of homogeneous space, would be applicable to such phenomena with a priori assured certainty although, of course, in a manner appropriate to the specific properties of the phenomenon concerned. While these properties in their infinite variety are conveyed through sense perception and are as accessible to manual producers as to scientists, the conceptual issues are the exclusive prerogatives of the intellectual workers. It is this theoretical part which holds the epistemological problem. The main one among these attaches to the understanding of nature by its laws, to the possibility and conditions of such understanding. G. Laws of Nature The discovery of natural laws was, this, was the set objective of the mathematical and experimental method of exact science, as understood and practiced in the classical Galilean Newtonian era. The rise of modern science ran parallel with the rise of modern capitalism. In part two of this study, we shall analyze their formal and inherent connection. At present, we are concerned to clear up the epistemological issue of science as raised by Kant, with whom we have one important point in common. Kant argued with great vigor and with a polemical edge against English empiricism that the discovery of natural laws presupposes the employment on non-empirical concepts such as, say, the concept of inertial motion as defined by Newton in his first law of motion. On the other hand, it is extremely difficult to see how such a concept, just because it is non-empirical and cannot be gleaned from nature or supplied by the practice of experience, could possibly give access to the inner workings of nature far beyond sense perception. It was this contradic contradiction which prompted Kant to turn the tables on all previous epistemological standpoints and to decide that, as the concepts of science could not be assumed to be modeled on nature, the only way to account for the facts of Newtonian science was to postulate that nature, or rather our human kind of experience, was modeled on the non-empirical concepts of our pure understanding. Now Kant was driven to this conclusion because he could not imagine that non-empirical concepts could possibly have natural or historical or in any case, spatio-temporal roots. The same holds true for all philosophical materialists. To their minds, anybody believing that non-empirical concepts play a vital part in science must be an idealistic thinker. 
Conversely, anybody resolved to adhere to his materialism is committed to hold mistaken ideas about ancient and bourgeois science. Our study is calculated to remedy this paradoxical situation, for we show that non-empirical concepts are not necessarily beyond the reach of imperialistic explanation. We are therefore in a position to dismiss both these philosophies, idealist and materialist, and to follow historical materialism as our only methodological guideline. H. The Guideline of Historical Materialism Marx contemplated human history as a part of natural history, a tangential part, as it were, which takes shape in the protracted process by which man succeeds in producing his own means of livelihood. This holds a promise that man will eventually assume control of his historical, his historical destiny, but until that stage is reached, the development of mankind is the result of blind necessity and is as much a working of natural history as, say, the generation of a new biological species would be in non-human nature. But the difference is that history, by being channeled through human society, brings forth mental rather than physical alterations in man, developments like language, conscious reflection, faculties of knowledge together with those of error and human self-delusion, and even possibly also of a social self-realization of man. True, the nature from which the non-empirical categories of intellectual labor are drawn is not the primary nature of physical reality, but the second, purely social nature which, in the epochs of commodity production, constitutes a vital part of that social being of men which determines their consciousness. However, the very categories which constitute second nature are products of man's natural history. Commodity exchange, when attaining the level of a monetary economy, gives rise to the historical formation of abstract cognitive concepts able to implement an understanding of primary nature from sources other than manual labor. It seems paradoxical, but is nevertheless true that one has first to recognize the non-empirical character of these concepts before one can understand the way in which their indirect natural origin through history achieves their validation. One might speak of science as a self-encounter of nature blindly occurring in man's mind. I. Money as a mirror of reflection. To trace the natural origin of such categories in this historical manner, or rather to develop them historically from their social roots, is well in keeping with the method advocated by Marx. In a much quoted footnote in Capital Volume 1, he calls this method the only materialist and therefore the only scientific one. I deem it superior to the theory of reflection, especially in regard to concepts of basic importance in intellectual labor divided from manual labor. Reflection, however it may be interpreted and differentiated, must be the activity of bodies with individual senses and individual brains, whereas abstract intellectual labor relies from the outset on terms of logical uniformity and, and universality. The contrast of approach and specificity of understanding can be brought out clearly by attempting to interpret our theory in terms of the theory of reflection. The role played by money and coinage in mediating the formation of the purely intellectual concepts, according to our explanation, can be likened to the party or the part played by a medium of reflection. The real abstraction of exchange is reflected in coinage in a manner which allows intellectuals to identify it in its distinct elements. But first of all, the reflection itself is not a mental process. Second, it is on a social scale. Third, it is, a, it is hidden to the consciousness of the participants. And fourth, it is associated with the formation of false consciousness. How could necessarily false consciousness be admitted as the medium for the reflection of truth or of true reflection? J, the social form of thinking. The fact that the reflecting medium of the real abstraction is coinage accounts for the creation of logical uniformity of the intellectual abstraction among all conceptual thinkers in an exchange society of a given stage and formation. But it does more than that. The basic categories of intellectual labor, we have seen, are replicas of the elements of the real abstraction, and the real abstraction is itself that specific characteristic which endows commodity exchange with its socially synthetic function. Therefore, intellectual labor in employing these categories moves in the mold of the formal elements of the social synthesis. 
The social th synthesis is the rationality of intellectual labor and its scientific activity. In classical antiquity, this included philosophy. Scientific work, its conceptual or theoretical part, if correctly done, is socially valid, not only because it rests upon a community of thinking among the intellectuals. It would have social validity even if it stood on lonely ground and met with the disagreement of everybody else in the existing confer confraternity of intellectuals and scientists. Throughout the ages of commodity production, from its initial form of ancient slave society to its ultimate capitalist completion, the products of manual labor are private property, whereas the products of intellectual labor are social property. If an individual mind conforms to the elements of the real abstraction, by which society itself forms a functioning network and an economically viable system, then this mind is by itself capable of producing socially valid results. For this mind acts intellectually for society. In fact, it does so in a super capacity. Much as society would itself act as an entirety of it if it were equipped with the necessary body and brain. Instead, it uses individual minds as its representatives. Such a mind then acts as the only one of its kind, excluding a plural in the same way as a society and money cannot be more than single at any time. A closer analysis would reveal that the transcendental unity of the self-consciousness, to use the Kantian expression for the phenomenon here involved, is itself an intellectual reflection of one of the elements of the exchange abstraction, the most fundamental one of all the form of exchangeability of the commodities underlying the unity of money and of the social synthesis. I define the Kantian transcendental subject as a fetish concept of the capital function of money, as it assumes representation as the ego cogito of Descartes or of the subject of cognition of philosophical epistemology, the false consciousness of intellectual labor reaches its culmination. The formation of thinking, which in every respect merits the term social, social, presents itself as the diametrical opposite to society, the ego of which there cannot be another. Kant has the appropriate formula for this contradiction. There is no ground in theoretical reason from which to infer to the existence of another being. Nothing could be wrapped in greater secrecy than the truth, that the independence of the intellect is owed to its originally social character. Science is equipped for its socially necessary tasks, but only with false self-awareness. Science here is understood as divided from manual labor. K. The social synthesis as the foundation of science. From the results so far, we can draw the general conclusion that, within the limits of commodity production, the valid foundations of the science of an epoch are those in keeping with the social synthesis of that epoch. We shall see that significant changes in the formation of the social synthesis indeed entail corresponding changes in the formation of science. We limit this conclusion to the epochs of commodity production. Objects of utility become commodities only because they are the products of the labor of private individuals who work independently of each other. This statement of Marx indicates the reason why a society based on this mode of production is in need of intellectual work by social thinking and why social thinking must be divided from physical labor. Physical production has lost its direct social cohesion and can form a viable totality only by the intermediary of a network of exchange under the rule of private property. As capital, it controls production in a variety of ways by slave labor, serfdom, or wage labor. It subjects manual labor to exploitation. The manual labor becomes impoverished, not only economically because of its exploitation, but also intellectually. Individual labor is in full control only in a small scale. Individual production of peasants and artisans. Only then is production based on the individual unity of head and hand. This artisan mode of production is ousted by capitalist production, initially by nothing more than a larger size changing its scale to the social one of simple cooperation in the Marxian sense of this term. Not infrequently, this enlarged scale was necessitated by the novel and special nature of the production task. Social history first embarked on commodity production with the beginning and development of Iron Age technology from the times of Greek antiquity onwards. It progressed slowly, culminating in modern capitalism where commodity production 
became the all-pervading form of production to the extent that practically no product whatsoever can any longer be produced except as commodity. Yet right up to the end of the 19th century, the productive forces at the disposal of mankind must still be classed as those of the Iron Age. This means that the basic pattern of commodity production, marked by the separation of the activities of physical work and the activities of social interrelationships, i.e. exchange, remains unchanged. But with the rise of monopoly capitalism around the turn of the century, the pattern began to show modifications, and there occurs a change of science and technology which marks a transformation of the productive forces into those of atomic physics and of electronics. These transformations will occupy us in part three of this volume, but the consequences are so novel and so enormous that nothing more than question marks at best intelligent ones can be within our scope.